I'd like to introduce Dave. What can I say beyond none of us would be in this room without him? So the, the same attention that he gives to his book and his writing, I've seen him pour into students that I've had. So Dave Thomas. Wow, fantastic conference. I'm not going to, I'm sure at the end uh, we will have a nice summary. So I'm not going to gush too much. But I must admit, I always enjoy these conferences. So thank you to everybody involved. Um, how many people have seen me speak at a previous Elixir event? Oh, fair number. Twice? All right. So the ones that have seen me speak, um, are kind of nervous right now. The ones that see me speak twice are kind of wondering if they can get out of the room <laughs> because I kind of have a bit of a, a nasty habit. Um, I tend to be the person that has talks like, oh, I don't know, o OTP is overrated. We, should, we shouldn't be using OTP that much. Right? Do it ourselves, why not? Um, I can actually claim Joe Armstrong agrees with me on this, but no one's going to contradict that. Um, <laughs> uh, Phoenix favors monoliths. No one's going to argue with that, obviously. Um, but I get in trouble. People don't like that. You know, I'm sort of like, you know, attacking the gods, and that doesn't go down well. Um, <sighs> our apps are boring. If I see one more damn web app, oh, kill me. Come on. <laughs> Non-web apps outweigh web apps by three orders of magnitude if you look at just processors. There are a thousand times more processors in small devices than there are in browsers. And that doesn't mean phones. That means smaller than phones. We have the best technology in the world for talking to those devices. And yes, we do have some projects that are looking at that. But as a, as a community, wow, we should be pushing that. But I'm not going to do that because that, be, that would be nasty and mean. And I'm not nasty and mean. Ah, oh, I did that. And we are not Elixir programmers. That one I'll defend to the hilt. I hate it when people say, you know, you say to someone, okay, first of all, this is an American thing, right? America is the only country, the US is the only country in the world where the first thing you say to someone you've never met before at a party or something is not, how are you? Or that's a really nice haircut. It's, what do you do? <laughs> Implicitly, how much do you make? because then I can judge myself against you, <laughs> right? No, 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 it's not true. In France, we do the same. You do? <laughs> OK. <laughs> I, I, you know, I hate to say it, but I think that makes my point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you are not an Elixir developer. You are a developer. But more to the point, you are a problem solver, and you're someone that's changing the world. Stop calling yourself an Elixir programmer. Jeez. All right, so let me see if I can use my buttons here. Yes. So the problem is I keep giving these talks, and I've done like five or six of these talks at various Elixir events, and I end up with an audience looking at me like that. <laughs> and I have to put that in. Everybody else has had pictures of their pet or their whatever else. And I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it because I am not that kind of person, right? That's me. <laughs> I'm sweet. I'm kind, right? I'm the little pussycat in the room. So this talk is not going to be why you all suck. <laughs> well, actually it is, but it's indirect. You won't notice it. You won't notice it. This is me putting on a happy face. And what I'm going to talk about is how I'm becoming a programmer. Yes, it's all about me. 
me, me, me. No, it's not. Here's the reason I'm saying how I'm becoming a programmer. I am sick, sick, sick of people telling other people how to do things. No one can tell you how to be a programmer, how to be a designer, how to be a good father or mother. It's none of their business. And what's more, it's beyond their understanding. No two of us are the same person. They're not in the same environment, in the same situation, doing the same work on the same code base, using the same tool set, particularly for a JavaScript programmer. So <laughs> given all of those things, it's impossible to tell anybody the best way of doing anything. There are no best practices. So. So I am going to tell you what I do. And you are free to ignore it or say, oh, it might be interesting or what a fool he is, whatever. So I am going to tell you how I'm trying to become a better programmer. Now, I added it up. And I have been programming for something like 48 years. And I think I have probably coded I'm not going to say every single day. I know that's not true. But every single day within, you know, 0.05% or something, right? Most days, vast majority of days in that time. And I used to joke that, you know, people would say, what do you do? And I'd say, you French? And I'd go, no. And they'd say, okay, what do you do? And I'd say, well, I'm a programmer. And... One day I'm hoping to get it right. You know, ha ha, that was a little joke. <laughs> and I've now realized that that's stupid because I'm never going to get it right. And that's okay. So my three goals, I want to be happy doing what I'm doing. And that's a two-edged goal. I want to do something that makes me happy. And I want to be happy while I'm doing that thing. I really want to keep developing, not as in coding, but as developing as a human being and learning. I think the word for a developer that's not developing is maintenance programmer. Um, or actually, no, unemployed. <laughs> because we, of all the industries on the planet, I think, put the strongest demands on our participants to learn. I don't think any other industry has the kind of half-life of inf information that we have. It's measured in a small number of years, not decades, not centuries, maybe five years, 10 years. And last and obviously more modestly, I think it's really important that we change the world for the better. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we get new treaties signed with different countries or that we, you know, cure some disease. I think we all recognize when what we do has an impact, when what we do has made things better than they were. And it can be better in a really small way. I mean, I remember when I was working in England in the 80s, we worked uh, at one point, uh, British Telecom had these terminals called Prestel terminals, and they were 20, no, 40 columns wide, 24 columns deep, eight colors, and they connected over a 300 baud modem, uh, eventually upgraded to, I think, a 1200 baud modem, and they basically, all you could display, you start at the top and you wrote whatever 24 times 40 was characters, and that was the screen, and then you sent it again, and that was the next screen. And these took off for some reason, I have no idea why, and we produced, one of my things my company produced was a system for travel agents where they could uh, make simple flight reservations online using these Prestel terminals. Because the other alternative was to use the airlines terminals and they were like, you know, four years worth of training before you could even log into them. So we did that. And I always remember the first time I walked down a high street in England and I looked through a window 
and I saw my code running on one of their terminals. And the sheer pleasure that gave me just to see something I'd done was being used. And I think that motivates a lot of us, right? So changing the world for the better is important. So goal number one, be happy. Zach talked about this earlier on. It's really important to be happy. As you know, the Carnation Company, back in 1904, initially came out with the uh, marketing concept that their cows were contented, and therefore their milk was better. And in fact, this being the world, there has been research on that. <laughs> so these two doctors actually performed a study that showed that if your farmer gave a cow a name and treated her as an individual, they increased milk yield by 500 pints a year. So I was going to stop software development and open a farm. And I was going to have like a day spa, um, maybe a walk through McDonald's. Oh, that's a little bit close to the bone. Um, <laughs> but I mean, also, I don't know if you, has anyone seen the film about Temple Grandin? You know, same idea, right? Reduce the stress, contented cows make better milk. And I think that's very true of all of us. So Andy and I uh, updated Pragmatic Programmer last year. And, <laughs> oh. and we actually rewrote a lot of it. It's kind of surprising how much got changed. I'd say about a third of the topics are new. And one of the new topics is actually the very first tip in the book. It's called, It's Your Life. And what it says is that as developers, we are blessed. As developers, we are probably in the most mobile industry that you can be in. We get to choose so many things about our lives. We get paid well. Right? We get to be able to travel if we want to. We get to be able to work at home if we want to and if we work at it. But a lot of us don't take advantage of that. A lot of us take what we're given and then maybe grumble about it a little bit. And the idea of it's your life is to say you actually can control this. You can think about what would make you happy, what would make you work better, what would make you more contented, and then how to work for it. Have the courage to ask for it. Have the courage to make yourself happy. Convincing people using Zach's points that it would actually make you more productive and altogether a better employee. And in fact, the very first body text tip in the book, we called the most important tip in the book. And one of the cool things about having an audio book is that I can actually save myself some work. Tip three, you have agency. And you do. You get to call the shots. Make yourself happy. You deserve it. So, no, but seriously, seriously. That's a strong goal. I have discovered in my career that whenever I find myself groaning when I have to do something, it's time to make a change. Whenever I get in the mirror, you know, and not just like short term, I mean, you're not that stupid, but I mean, if it's like every day for a month, you have to drag yourself out of bed, think about it and fix it. All right, goal number two. Growing, it is one of the privileges of our industry that we get to learn the whole time. It's also one of the burdens. It's incredibly hard. I mean, we're sitting there drinking from a fire hose of new information, new techniques, etc. But it is vital that we actually start sipping from it at least. Because if you don't, you stagnate. If you stagnate, you're out of date. If you're out of date, you're not employed. Now, if you've gone to any of my um, talks back ooh, 10, 12 years ago, I was talking a fair amount about these two guys, Stuart and Hubert 
Dreyfus. Anybody remember the talks about the Dreyfus brothers? No? Great, great. This is all new material I just did for this talk. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So the Dreyfus brothers were, well, kind of jack of all trades in the philosophy slash psychology slash learning slash whatever industries. Um, and they were asked by the Air Force to help out because the Air Force found that they were having problems training pilots. They had manual after manual after manual on how to train pilots. And they claimed that they were telling the pilots everything they should do. And yet they just weren't doing it right. So they got the Dreyfus brothers in to look at this. And they produced a report that has been argued about. And the details have been picked at. But I think fundamentally, there's a lot of truth in this. Their report is declassified. You can get it online. Um, <laughs> for a declassified report, this tells you something about the environment. There are nine separate rubber stamps on the cover of it, approving its declassification, plus, I think, four sets of initials. Um, the report is called a five-stage model of the mental activities involved in directed skill acquisition. And the important, num uh, important words there are mental activities and skill acquisition. Directed skill acquisition, that's what we're doing. We're trying to learn something. Yeah, we're not just being like a toddler who's experiencing the entire world and gradually soaking it all in. We need to know something, a particular thing. And this is what they're talking about. And they came up with a model which is slightly arbitrary, it doesn't matter, right? The details may not be right. They never really claim that they are. It's the overall model that's important. In their model, you have five phases that you go through achieving some kind of mastery. Obviously, you start out as a novice. If you've never done something before, if you don't know anything about something, you are, by definition, a novice. After a while, they claim you move from being a novice to being competent. That move must be one of the proudest moments in your life. Imagine you go home and you tell your partner, darling, I'm competent. You know, no, but you're competent. Then after a while, you graduate to being proficient, like being a Boy Scout, really. Then maybe you become an expert. And then finally, you try achieve mastery. I tried very hard to degender this slide, but I'm not too sure mistressy actually has the same meaning. So mastery is going to be. <laughs> and here's the thing, and it ties into the previous talk really strongly. The thing that takes you up that set of steps is experience. It is not reading. It's not talking. It's not thinking, it's doing. That's what they found. And I think it's interesting just to go through them in just a little bit more detail. So if you're a novice, you have no experience whatsoever. You don't know anything about this environment. And therefore, you have to be given explicit rules about what to do when because you have no way of interpreting what's happening otherwise. You have zero context in which to work. If I'm about to jump out of an airplane with a parachute for the very first time, I really do not want to have a lecture on Bernoulli numbers. I want to be told what to pull and when. That's all. Has anybody here either learned to drive recently or taught someone to drive recently? Yeah? What do you think about the conversational possibilities of talking to a learner driver for the first couple of weeks when they're driving? Zero. They have no bandwidth for any kind of philosophical discussion about you know, road etiquette. They are white knuckle, how do I not kill people? <laughs> right? That is a novice. Now, I'm quoting from the report here because they draw all this in terms of pilots. 
And it's kind of like nicer to talk outside our industry when we're talking about being a novice. Novice pilot knows how to read the cockpit instruments and how to manipulate the controls in response to such features as instrument readings and context-free visual clues such as, okay, I love this, the angle of displacement of the horizon. <laughs> Otherwise known as, we're dying! <laughs> but that's what the novice can do, right? The novice can respond. They've been told, if this is high, push that. If this is low, pull that. And as a novice, you'll fly around four or five hours doing that until you've kind of worked out the ropes. And at some point, you'll become competent. And now what you're starting to learn is patterns. You are dealing with stimuli, and you have started to develop the ability to respond to stimuli kind of quasi-automatically. If the nose starts to drop, you may find yourself pulling back slightly on the stick without realizing that you actually went through the conscious process of saying, oh, the nose is dropping, I need to pull back. So you are using now, rather than rules, you're using guidelines. A guideline is a rule that you can break. It's a suggestion. In general, if you see that the nose is dipping, you want to pull back on the stick. Maybe, though, you also want to put a bit more throttle in. Maybe you want to check for icing on the wings, whatever it might be. Right? It's less than a rule. It's more of a guideline. So now you're developing context. You're beginning to see what you're doing as part of being a bigger picture. Again, to read from then, competent pilot can recognize aspects such as we're high in the landing approach, or we're verging on a stall, or we have a dangerous crab angle. And they know the kind of things they're supposed to do to correct for that. In a way, they're beginning to use macros to execute what they're doing. The next step up, though, is a, ba a really big step, is the step up to proficiency. Up till now, we've been dealing with individual tasks. And those tasks can become like more complicated, but they're still just being a task. Now, we're dealing with meeting a goal. And we have to work out what tasks to do to meet that goal. So we're strategic. And that is a lot harder because it, we need to have a recipe, sorry, we need to have ingredients that we can call on to meet that particular need. Uh, and that also means we become responsible. Up until now, people have told us what to do. Now we are deciding what to do. Proficient pilot, this is kind of weird, intent on making a safe landing, sees as salient, see, sorry, sees the landing angle and the crab landing approach, uh, start again, the landing envelope and the crab angle as salient and ignores the terrain beyond the far end of the land runway. Okay, so that's what they're doing in that particular moment. But then they suddenly decide, oh, you know what, I'm gonna have to go around. There's a cow on the runway being contented. So <laughs> what am I gonna do? Now, and not only do I have to go around, but I have to switch what's important to me. I now no longer care about the landing envelope. What I care about is the train at the end of the runway. So that changes my entire perspective. And if I'm proficient, I can do that. So next up the list is you become an expert. You stop thinking about what you're doing in terms of all the individual acts. You're not aware of the fact that you're taking in all this information. It just happens. And this sounds a little bit mystical, but it's not really. Um, another word for this is intuition. And people say to me, that is ridiculous, Dave. We are engineers. We are scientists. We use math. We are not intuitive. We're deterministic. We do everything according to rules or by the book. There is no room for intuition in software development. Let me ask you a question. How many of you 
have been working on a problem. So maybe you know, around about lunchtime, some problem p picks up. And you look at it, and you're late to lunch because you're trying to solve this problem. Nothing happens. Come back from lunch, and you still can't work it out. And you're sitting there the entire afternoon. You bring people over to look at it. No one can see it. It's really, really frustrating. And you keep doing stuff. You end up doing stuff you regret later, not changing stuff you really shouldn't have changed. But you do it. You stay late that night. You get home. You are miserable to be with because your brain is still going, I don't get how I can't see what's wrong with this code. You go to sleep. You're tossing and you're turning. You finally, you fall asleep. And the next morning, you wake up knowing what the problem was. How many people? Yeah, there's no room for intuition <laughs> in software development. Intuition, well, I'll get to that in a second. This is, I love, I love this one. The magnitude and importance of the change from analytic thought to intuitive response is the experience of a pilot who suddenly realizes he's flying an airplane. and realizes, wow, I'm doing something really difficult, and it's working. <laughs> they've measured this. They've actually gone into airplanes, and they've pointed out to pilots in the middle of a flight how hard what they're doing is. And they've measured their performance in terms of number of corrective inputs a second and this kind of stuff. Their performance drops dramatically once they tell them that they're doing something like this. I think that's fascinating. And then... Lastly, we get to mastery. The expert is capable of experiencing moments of intense absorption in his work, her work, during which his her performance transcends even its usual high level. We're getting a little bit gushy here. This masterful performance only takes place when the expert can cease to pay conscious attention to his performance and can let all the mental energy previously used in monitoring his performance go into producing almost instantaneously the appropriate perspectives. We have a word we use for that. It's flow. Now, I'm not necessarily a big fan of flow. I think you can actually, you can be really productive, but also screw a whole bunch up in flow state, but it's there. People recognize that. Okay, so they got this mental model and just to kind of show how it's, I mean, partly the reason you know that this is kind of artificial is just how convenient this ends up being. They have four axes they measure things along. Recollection, that's how well can you work out what it is you need to know. Sorry, that's how much you know of what's going on. Uh, the recognition is how do you actually see things. Decision making is, okay, now I have to make a decision on this. And I'm aware, am I actually aware of what I'm doing or is it just happening naturally, okay? And they go from being, recollection being non-situational, as in I don't know anything apart from the context of what I'm looking at, to uh, situational. Recognition is decomposed, individual components, to holistic. Oh, you can read, yeah? And the reason I think it's all kind of like a little bit contrived is you have this really beautiful little graph that comes out of that, right? As you move from novice to master, then you gradually turn each of those things green. So, in their model, and like I say, I don't believe there's necessarily the five steps, I don't necessarily believe all of their descriptions, I don't care. Because in their model, there's one really fundamental facet, which I know is true. And that is, as you progress up the steps, you move from being rule-based to intuition-based. You are developing intuition. And you develop intuition the same way you develop intuition doing anything. How do you learn to ride a bicycle? You get on the bicycle, you pedal and fall off. You get on the bicycle, you pedal and fall off. There was a, a fad in the mid-1970s called inner sport. And the idea of inner sport was that real performance comes from your body being able to do it without your mind being involved. And when you think about it, that's true. If I said to you, describe the actions you take to catch a ball, 
you probably couldn't do it. Because you're solving a differential equation in your head. And not only that, you're actually judging the correct amount to move, I don't know, 50 muscles, to make that actually then intersect with the trajectory of a ball. That's not something you can do consciously. Now, the you know, tennis thing is kind of cool. The, say you were learning how to serve. What would happen is the uh, instructor, the coach, would take a chair and stick it at some point on the far side of the court, probably on the little tee. And then they'd get a laundry basket full of tennis balls. And they would say, throw the ball up in the air and hit it. Do not aim for the chair. Instead, out loud, say whether your ball is to the left, to the right, in front of, or behind the chair. So you hit the ball and go behind and to the right. Hit the ball behind. Hit the ball, you know, whatever, right? And you would do that for an hour. And then the instructor would say, okay, stop. Now I want you to hit the chair. And you'd throw the ball up in the air and you'd hit the chair. And you'd throw the ball up in the air and you'd hit the chair. Every single time. What had happened is you had trained your subconscious, your non-conscious. I don't like subconscious brain, your non-conscious brain. And that's the thing that's doing all the work. That's the thing that's doing all the differential equations and moving the muscles and everything else. Your conscious brain can't do that. It's way too stupid to do that. It's your subconscious that does that. And so this whole process of learning is a question of internalizing. It's a question of training your reflexes, your intuition, so that you can do this thing without having to think. Because the less you have to think about the mechanics of what you're doing, the more you can think about the bigger picture, and therefore the better you will be. Questions? Where do you think you are? Juggling. Juggling. Okay, so we're going from one, which has never done it, to five, give me eight balls and a chainsaw and I'll go for it. Okay, so one, two, hey, three. Oh, there's a hand back there. How many balls? Okay, four. I can't see. Five, I guess not. All right. Driving. <laughs> one. Two, three, four, five. Yeah, everybody's a great driver. It's the other people are idiots. You're right. <laughs> Actually, you are all probably three, fours, or fives. Because most of you, I'm sure, can drive without having to consciously remember which one's the brake and which one's the accelerator. Most of you can probably get to the store and not actually remember having driven there. The times that you remember driving is when you say, oh, look at that, there's an accident up there. I'm going to take a detour, right? When you're overriding the stuff that your automatic brain can do. So, yeah, you probably all are up there. Anybody better than a one at robbing banks? <laughs> you, sir, and I are going to have a talk after this. <laughs> yeah. And here's the crucial one. Where are you in software development? One, two, three, four, five. You're all wrong. Mostly Bruce, but you're all wrong. Um, you're all wrong for, it's a trick. And the trick is, there's no such thing as software development. <laughs> Anybody who said, yeah, I'm a four in software development, if I gave you a snowball program and said debug this, you'd be like, what the hell? <laughs> right? Suddenly you're not a master anymore. Or an expert. You know, suddenly you're a beginner. The actual reality is people have done measurements across many, many industries, and it actually looks, the distribution of people has what I have come to call a belly curve, 
where <laughs> most people sit around a high two. Can anybody think why you sit around a high two? You got it to compile. <laughs> ah, okay. Yes, to some extent, it's because things change so quickly. However, we can factor that out by saying you're a high two at doing whatever you were doing. Yeah? Here's the reason. What's the difference between the two and the three in terms of your planning, in terms of your direction? When you're a two, you're told what to do. When you're a three, you work it out for yourself. And a lot of people don't like to do that. And when you don't like to do that, you don't. And you sit there, fat, dumb, and happy, doing the same thing all every day because that's what you're comfortable doing. So why am I going through all of this about the model? I'm doing it for a couple of reasons. First of all, for you, because constantly learning means that you are constantly going to be putting yourself down at level one. It means you are constantly going to move from I'm the king of everything I survey to being help. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Tell me. And most people who feel that they've earned some kind of respect in the industry, hate, hate having to go to someone and say, well, I don't understand. Tell me what to do. So it's a feeling that I think you have to become comfortable with. In fact, you have to embrace it. Because every time you sit there thinking, I haven't the faintest idea what's going on here, every time you have that feeling, it means that you are on an accelerated path to learning something. Because the incremental learning from three to four is all fine tuning. Yeah, you're good at something, you're just gonna get a little bit better. But the difference between one and two is like 80% of the entire amount of things you need to know. It's phenomenal. So every time you get from a one to a two, I'll get to a three, just because that way you'll be comfortable, right? Then find something where you can shoot back down the curve to a one and start again. Don't throw away the other stuff. That's what pays the bills. It's the one that pays tomorrow's bills. It also is really deeply significant because every single one of you is a mentor. Every single one of you is helping other people learn. And as you do that, bear this in mind. If you are teaching someone who is a novice in a particular situation, I always used to be like really careful and like, you know, encourage them in their mistakes and all this kind of like hairy fairy kind of stuff. They don't want that. They want to be told what to do. They want to be told how to learn what to do for themselves. When I learned to fly a long time ago now, my instructor, Paul, an actor, um, would, he was excellent. I don't know if he, he was like trained to do this or if he worked it out for himself. But when I was like in the one and two phases, he would say things like, so I, mean, I was flying along, right? And maybe I was about to stall or I was like leaning towards stalling. And he would say things like, hmm, it's getting quieter. Or he'd say, do those controls get feel a bit mushier than they used to? You know, and it would never be, you idiot, you're about to stall. But it would be a cue. It would be something where I could go, oh, the controls feel mushy, therefore I'm losing authority, therefore I'm about to stall. Ah. I'll push the stick forward. He would ask the questions that would help me move from a one to a two because he would be giving me the correspondence between the situation and the response. 
So when you're teaching people, that's a really important thing to do. When you're teaching beginners, tell them what to do. When you're teaching people who are just above beginners, give them situational clues. When you're teaching people at threes and fours, A, make sure you are actually teaching them, and teach them in terms of metaphor. That's why we're constantly using metaphor with each other. That's what a pattern language is. That's what all of the kind of jargon in the industry is. It's all metaphor. And that's how you communicate with experts. Oh, and never, ever, ever have someone at level five try to teach you anything. <laughs> so here is my personal plan for growing. Yours will be different. Do not copy mine. <laughs> There's only room for one at the top. <laughs> first, first rule. It is your responsibility and your responsibility alone to do this. People sometimes say, but Dave, my company doesn't give me time to read or study or do whatever else. And I say, no, they don't. <laughs> because it's none of their business. Right? They don't care. It doesn't add to them particularly. Yeah, sure maybe every now and then. But this is you investing in you. This is your time investing in your future. You are all paid probably twice what you would get in any other industry. Part of the cost of that is keeping your value. And keeping your value means growing. Sorry, that's a bit naggy, but it's true. How do I know what to look at? Well, I have something I call the rule of three which is if I come across something I haven't heard of before three times in about two weeks, then I'll say, oh, that might be interesting, and I have a little list of things that I research. I try really, really hard not to go and do it immediately just because that's kind of like what I do. But, I mean, <laughs> rule of three, if you see it three times, research it. And you never know, it may be interesting. Two times. Now, two times isn't enough. Two times is somebody no, two times is somebody copying somebody else's post, right? Two times is A and then B going, I agree. <laughs> research. When you do research, do research. Don't follow every single fad. Don't like just, oh, you know, that's got a really cool name. I'll go see what it does, right? Look at things wisely. What's this going to do for me? How's this going to help me? What, in what way is this interesting? In what way is it something I don't know anything about? And that's my last point. Diversity is important. You're investing in yourself. Anybody who does investing will say diversity is how you protect yourself from change. But diversity means becoming a novice. So be prepared to diversify. And then last, just because I've noticed this in myself, I have a calendar entry that repeats every six months. And all it does is it says, comfortable, question mark. And it makes me think about it. And if I say, yeah, then I immediately have to stop what I'm doing and go and find something else. Because I don't want to be comfortable. Not too long, right? OK, this leads me to the last point. And this was covered really well um, all over the place. Another Thomas, maybe. Um, and that is the idea of doing good. And in fact, it was so important to us that it became the last tip. Actually, not even a tip. It's an entire chapter in the book. The last tip in the book is about being, doing good, about being conscious of what you do. It's about calling stuff out when you're asked to do things that are wrong. It's about thinking about the consequences of what you do. We, I mean, when you think about it, Twitter, right? An application that originally allowed you to send 144 character messages to people that didn't care, right? <laughs> has actually changed the world. People have died because of Twitter. Revolutions have been won because of Twitter. It's an incredible responsibility for what was just a kind of throwaway cool app. 
So one of the things that we really recommend is that the Nuremberg defense didn't work at Nuremberg and it's not going to work for you. I was just following orders means that you're not a human being. So we actually have three tips in this chapter because it was important enough. First tip. Tip 98. First, do no harm. Second one. Tip 99. Don't enable scumbags. <laughs> You have to love the word, the way she said the word, scumbags. And then, just because we felt we were getting just a little bit, hmm, last tip in the book is also tip important. Tip 100. It's your life. Share it, celebrate it, build it. And have fun. Thank you.